Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mental Mobility Podcast, episode number 114, 114 here, here, and there is a new host today. The host's not going to be me. Interesting, right? New little surprises every single week. There's a new host today taking over the show, not me. So get ready, get set, in your seats, ready for the podcast? Well, then let's get to it. Here we go. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mental Mobility Podcast. I just shook the mic because it's going to be that exciting right now. We have a great podcast coming up. It's a little different, okay? We have a friend, Laura Quirk. She reached out to me telling me about a friend of hers that has this new project coming up. And this project is a book. And with this book, the main concept is they're really trying, she's really trying to stop the stigma or beat the stigma. We all know the stigma of mental health. We all have heard of it and or experienced it ourselves, right? So it's really cool. I'd like to introduce to you, Laura Quirk, the author. Whoa, author. Author, that's author. a fancy word. <laughs> of a book, uh, maybe a name of the book, kind of a name of the book. Yeah, as of right now, the work in progress, I'm calling it Stories from the Psych Word. Ooh, so, and that's... what so what's the really I kind of touched up on it what's the real big reason that you want to put this together so I was in a support group and it was just a very general mental health therapy kind of thing so it was people from all walks of life all different kinds of mental illness and you know they'd come on I remember there was this one guy who was like big muscular Hispanic guy who like didn't smile and I was like <laughs> Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) But he is literally the sweetest guy I've ever met. I call him my brother now. Uh, And he's just got an amazing story. And the more I got to know these people and hear their stories, I was like, you know, you hear a diagnosis and that can be all you hear. You can hear somebody has an eating disorder. Somebody attempted suicide. This person has PTSD and You know, until you really hear the stories, they're very inspiring. And I had one friend who had just graduated. She was just going into nursing and then the COVID pandemic hit and she was a trauma nurse on the COVID unit. And she said, everyone just died. Like they were putting bodies in trucks in the parking lot because they had nowhere to put them. And her fellow nurses were getting sick and dying and Like that was very traumatic for her. I had another friend who was a police officer and he had just seen so much trauma and so many deaths. And, you know, that takes a toll on anybody. There was another woman whose son passed away. You know, when you just get to hear these people's stories and what they've been through, it just really makes mental illness more relatable. And I think people need to hear that. They need to hear the story and get to know the person behind the diagnosis. So. That's my goal is just to make mental illness more relatable, try to do away with some of that stigma and uh, share people's stories. It's a a great idea. Um, Stories are so impactful, especially now nowadays where it's so general just to hear. Like you said, they have anxiety. They tried to commit suicide. Then everyone develops its own story in their head. Right. And it's Mm -hmm. usually a general one. Like, well, how'd you do it? Are you copy? Couldn't, you know. You couldn't handle life. You know, you need instead of like putting this. And blame sometimes on them. those words are just thrown around yes. when you don't actually have a diagnosis. Like, oh, sorry, that's my OCD or, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and there are people who are really struggling with it that are yeah. like, screw you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, this is my OCD. Yeah. OCD. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? A little background? Before that, real quick, like it's the first time I'm meeting you. So if you guys know, this this is the first time meeting. So yes, this is brand new for both of us. So it's kind of, I think it's good. That's kind of like a good jumping off start point for both of us. Um, I'm Laura. I live in Jersey. I grew up in Morris County, but now I'm in Sussex, middle of nowhere. (laughs) I live on a horse farm. Um, Yeah. 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 So, what that's great I mean, it was like lifelong dream and yeah. it's a lot of work but it's worth it it's like especially in the mental health world like yeah. anytime somebody's struggling i'm like okay you either need a dog or a horse that's right. <laughs> clearly the answer 100 percent, or both on a okay. horse farm or both i've got a couple of each <laughs> so horse farm yes i've um, never seen one until i moved here 
like moving really? to Nevada and Las Vegas, yeah. who knew that there were horse farms, but my neighbors are horse farmers. Like if you get out of this complex, mm. everyone has horses and I, the horse yes. crossing signs with a cowboy on it. Like I, I thought that, that's right? real. <laughs> never knew it. And you have in Sussex, New Jersey, which is something like I never even thought of there right. up there. I'd always think like a little more down South and then the West. It's crazy. You could drive 20 minutes and it's a completely different land. So like- crazy. Where our I love our Facebook page, the like the Sussex County Facebook page, because it's constantly just like, watch out, there's cows loose on 94. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, who's losing cows? And other people are like, these goats are in my front yard. I'm like, I love Sussex County. <laughs> yeah, a little different. Definitely a little different. different. Definitely a little different. But, cool. Um, so yes, animals are a big deal. Um I have a master's degree in child advocacy and policy. So I do a a little bit with that, but I kind of just keep coming back to the animals. (laughs) So I kind of work all over the place. I volunteer with horses at an equine therapy barn. And I don't know. I'm not that exciting. That sounds (laughs) exciting. I say to you, not exciting. To everyone else that lives (laughs) in an apartment in New York City, fucking like, what? There's a horse farm? (laughs) Yes. You know? And, uh, Everyone's life's exciting. It just depends. I thought on about you're... doing this on my farm, just with the horses in the oh, background, because they're pretty entertaining. But yes, it's, it's raining. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's like cloudy now. It looks like it's gonna rain, but it's probably raining somewhere in Nevada over there. Yeah. But not We're here. Keeping it in Jersey. It's, yep. I'm not gonna lie. I kind of miss it. I do until I'm there and it's raining. I'm like, I really yeah. don't miss it anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not that great. <laughs> So we're going to get started here. If you didn't know the format, I think I said we have an exciting new format, but I never said it. What we're going to do today is we're going to go reverse podcast. So she's going to interview me, right? The story is here. She sent me, when she first reached out, she sent me this form. I have it down on the ground with all these questions inside it. And these questions are so complex that I'm terrible at writing and typing that I asked her if she would just like to do a video. Like if we could just call and just, you know, then she could take, I will record it and then she could just, uh, you know, type it out afterwards or transcribe it. And I was like, why not do a reverse podcast where she gets to ask me the questions and now you guys could learn a little bit more about me because sometimes in my stories, in my podcast, I just, I'll put a story here and there and you probably have to watch it from the beginning to understand exactly where I came from. So thought it'd be yeah. a good idea. All I right. was thinking this is good because like I was going back and looking at some of your podcasts, but it's hard to piece together who you are from, you know, yeah. that. So I'm like, this would be good for people. If anyone really just wants to know who you are, Ooh. <laughs> there you go. No, thanks. are you ready yeah all right so let's get it started mental mobility podcast episode something something reverse (laughs) reverse starring what's going on guys and welcome to the sunset script this is a segment called the sunset script why because i write things in my book or my book my phone and this one says most people will fight change as if change would be worse than their current experience hmm let's think about that take a haul take a drops take some mushrooms and think about that most people will fight change as if change would be worse than their current situation. We've all been there. I've been there. I was afraid to do things differently. I was afraid to change. I was afraid that everything that I had would disappear. And guess what? It did. Right? And I didn't want to do anything about it. I wanted to sulk. I wanted to hang out. I wanted to try to keep things the same. But I was afraid of that change. But not only that, I didn't want any experience more of having to want to change. But it's crazy, right? Because we think that things of the future or bettering bettering ourselves is going to be worse than what we're currently going through. We're in hell. If you're in hell, you're in hell. And you don't want to be there. So there has to be change. But something with us, something about us doesn't want to do it. It wants to hold on. It wants to stay compliant. It wants to keep doing what it's used to doing. That was a guy on a motorized bike. But we want to keep doing what we're doing. Let's keep this shorter. Don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to step out of your box. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to do something different. Because we have to change. And that's life. Life is all about changing. 
not about being in one place for the rest of your life. It's about doing things differently, experiencing new tasks, and taking life by its, I want to say balls, but it's balls. Back to the podcast. Here we go. So I always just start off asking people to just tell me your story, like in your own words, not necessarily just mental health related, but just childhood Anything important in your life that you think really shaped you into who you are today? That's a very long question. That's uh that's gonna be a that's long gonna one. be the whole podcast. Yep, the whole thing. <laughs> so, uh, basically, I was raised in New Jersey. Right, I'm from Belleville, New Jersey. Filipino. I was born uh, in Belleville. What? See, yeah. <laughs> really? Mass. Yeah, me too. What's your birthday? November September twenty second. Okay. <laughs> oh, coming up, but like if that's the same birthday, <laughs> I'd be um, weird. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I grew up Filipino culture, Filipino parents, one hundred percent inside of all Italian neighborhood. So I was overweight as a child since I ate a lot of rice, and it really ever controlled my eating habits. Um, developed into you know just this fat kid syndrome. So growing up was tough, especially with being Asian. I guess you could say overweight or fat. And just trying to fit in, right? It was always hard to do so. We kind of developed all these identities, what we would call, um, my brother would say a hologram, right? What happens in your past, your future, you try to put it together to try to figure out this person that you are. And growing up, just really was a people pleaser person, right? Because I always want to just not get beat up. I always just want to not get made fun of. I didn't want to get bullied. So I kind of rode my whole, I guess, grammar school, middle school, even high school life, just trying to use humor, use the way I dressed, my uniqueness, right, they would say, which I kind of, you know, I definitely grabbed onto it more now. Um, but just trying to protect myself, because I was scared of getting jumped, beat up, you know, and that's really one of or most of the traumas that I still work with, with my therapist is the fear of getting like jumped. Because one time, I was at Sizzler in Sea Caucus, New Jersey, this was uh, this a weird, Jersey. crazy little store. Yeah, in Jersey. <laughs> and it was the time where all the kids used to just wear these ski masks. They wear a ski mask and then, and like, you know, just hats. So we finished uh, watching a movie, finishing at Sizzler. And then we went into this lot to wait for our ride um, near Sizzler. And some kid was like, give me your jacket. Or get my friend, give me your jacket. And we're like, no. So we started to run. And then the one kid just pulled the gun out on us. And like, for the first time ever, I didn't know what to do. You know, and I didn't think that was trauma, right? I didn't think that moment in time could have been traumatic. Yeah. I hear that a lot that people don't, you know, qualify their trauma as trauma. But yeah, 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 I think that's anything there. Anytime there's a gun pulled on you, I call that trauma. (laughs) Yeah, I think with a gun, it's like even like seeing a gun, like, oh, geez, you know, in, in that in that manner where you're already scared and like the worst fear of your life is to get shot. Right. And yeah, it's just happening in, in front of you for a jacket, which is weird, you know, to me. So we obviously didn't get shot, but we had to sit there and just wait for our ride. And then luckily, my cousin had a gun, too. <laughs> so he came out of the movie theater. They were a ride. They picked that. We told them what was happening. They were like, what? They ran to their car. And then like 17 Asians came and come saved us because they all had guns. And I was like, all right, we won. But still, that whole experience at 13 years old, it's like, wow. Well, I was going to ask how old you were. Yeah, I was 13, 14 at that time. So, like I said, uh, that story I could say is the pinpoint of a lot of things that happened to me from, mm-hmm. you know, trying to now work out and be perfect or be stronger, you know. So, I want to be stronger, get more in shape. Uh, so, I joined wrestling and then I developed eating, eating disorders from there. I was bulimic until I was about 33. I kind of, I mean, I can never say that I'm over it. Like, it's still a fight. Yeah, it's, it's weird, one right? Of those things, it's one of yeah. those things. Yeah. Where it's like, ah, uh-huh. but like the more you study it now and the more you understand that, yeah, all those things are traumatic and trying to be better, you really get to understand more about the little things that you say and do every day. Like, for me, talking about how hungry I am, I'm starving. Like, my wife's like, you know, that's not normal. Like, you say it so much. <laughs> that food is controlling you again. And it's like, I really, you know, have to work. I mm-hmm. still have to work on a lot of that stuff. So those are always the underlying things um, behind it from childhood, from what yeah. I can pinpoint as traumatic. But I'm sure there's more stories than that. Yeah, it's the things you haven't realized are traumatic yet. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
did you want me to dig any more into that or do you have any questions based That's off that? That's up to you. Yeah. I, don't, I just, sometimes I feel like I could talk forever. That's why. Or like what <laughs> stories are going to be the the ones that are going to do it. Um, people pleaser. Hmm, I can't say that's pretty much very strict and disciplined household. Um, I was not allowed to do a lot, but I still could, you know, I, I snuck, snuck out or snuck things. Um, and doing so is very sneaky. Um, as a child, um, I pretty much raised my brother. So my parents both worked. So a lot of the time, um, because not having a chance to be, I guess, a kid, mm -hmm. you just have all the responsibility and Filipino culture. You're like, you're like a dad at age 11, like you're washing dishes, you're cooking, like I would cook at nighttime uh, for my brother, even though my grandparents, my, my grandmother there, stuff like that, but I would watch him all day long. So it's, it was, it's a different raising, you know, than what mm -hmm. I've, I've seen in or heard of. Um, but that was just culture, you know, that's things that we deal with. And culture is another thing, right? And I know mm -hmm. Indian Asian cultures are very deep into me mental illnesses, but don't accept the fact that they are mentally ill, you know, right. or yeah. So yeah, that that just adds another layer to the stigma. Yeah. You know. uh, what about now? Where are you? Where are you at now? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, now I'm better. I'm actually this year, I can say it was the first year that I felt like myself again, or actually feel like me, right? It's hard to say um, or figure out who you are, because we have so many constraints that kind of hinder our progress, whether it be a job, a career, financial freedom, um, kids, family, and we don't get the chance to do things that we actually love to do, right? And you know, financially, I'm, trust me, I'm not, I'm not financially free, but I don't care. You know, I don't have that that underlying like, oh, my God, we have to have this. We have to get this. We have to get this anymore. Um, obviously, creativity wise, I'm not scared to do anything like I'm going to do it. And so I always have that 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 feeling that I can express myself freely and talk about whatever it is I want to talk about without anything holding me back. Um, and I guess after I left Jersey, that healing process started, you know, it really took that pandemic. It really took us moving out here for me to heal because, you know, as happy and as outgoing as I assumed to be on social media and in my gym, um, if you didn't know, I, I had a gym in Nutley. Um, that's where I met Lisa. And uh, we'll talk, we could talk about that later. Um, yeah, I just had to put this face on where I was good. I was okay. I was strong. I was tough because I really wanted to take care of them first. You know, I took care of everybody. I really tried to take care of every single person that crossed my path, um, except for myself. And a and, lot of that probably carries over from childhood where you were a people pleaser and, you know, kind of yes. the funny fat kid, you know, that's right. the facade. So, yeah. Right. Um, what is it about funny fat, yeah. Vegas that like, was it Jersey that do you feel like, like you had to leave Jersey to heal? It wasn't even like a, I didn't want to leave New Jersey at all. You know, it just, it just was placed on us. It, it kind of feels like you always say like, you're always things that happen are meant to be right. Everyone says that, but at the time it just didn't feel like it. Like when we had to close a gym, we couldn't afford our house. Anymore. So it was either sell the house and move in with my parents in, in Belleville or moved to New York City in an apartment with my with my wife's uh, my wife's mom and we didn't want to go back to my parents house because obviously the con you know it's just the relationship between your parents and yourself it's just you don't end up growing and we didn't want to go backwards you know and then my wife out of nowhere got this offer to move out here for her job because they moved from New Jersey and they're moving to Las Vegas. So she came and asked me, "Is like, what about Las Vegas? You know, of course, I was like, this is, you're crazy. No way. Let's just go look. And at first we were going to move to Texas to see. I was like, let's just check Texas out. And then we went there and I was like, eh. Austin's like, it was Austin, Texas. It was just everyone kind of was going there and it just felt not that, I didn't get that vibe, you know, and I'm big on vibe and how it feels. Yeah. And, I just didn't get it, you know? And then we landed in Vegas and I was like hung up for one day and we went looking at a house and it just felt better. Something about it felt good, right? And when we got here, it was very tough, right? And everyone says it usually takes a year to feel better or to adapt to Las Vegas. And it really did. It took a year of me, you know, letting go of everything that I've had. And I think the best part about it here is the openness and the freedom that I have without knowing anybody. I couldn't go to ShopRite without seeing 17 people and them asking me questions about crank, how am I doing? How's everything going? How's the gym? 
and it would happen every single day during the mm-hmm. pandemic, which is not, not, not bad because they were concerned, right? They were genuinely concerned about how I was doing, how I was doing. But the more people ask you, the more you're just reminded of like how hard this is, this is to try and to like, how do you heal when you're just reminded of things over and over right. and over again? You know, that's why when you said you lived in a horse ranch or a horse farm, it's like that openness and freedom just to be away from people, mm-hmm. not in a yeah. bad way, sometimes gives you that freedom to actually think about what do you want, you know, and it lets you think about how you want to live your life now versus like, I wanted to try to recreate, keep recreating this, this feeling that was great. My right? crank was great. I can't say it. it was a hands down the best time of my life and the worst time of my life because it was just so cool to have that many like-minded people in one place. And it was just like a big family over and over again. But then again, I started taking on more than I, I should have, you know, and really yeah. trying to help every single person there and not That's doing it for nice myself. Familiar. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Las Vegas did it. You know, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was the quick change or the stars or the sun or the, you know, the aura, the, the mountains and the energy, but it just, it feels like it, you know, and um, it was just a weird transition. And then it just feels so much better this year. And it's just like, I can feel like what I used to feel when I first opened Crank. Like it's excitement for like what's ahead versus like, oh, I can't believe this happened to me. And now we're just here. You know? I think there's something about boundaries when you realize like I am burnt out. I need to set some boundaries with people. And that's something you can do with new people. <laughs> but setting boundaries with old people that you are ready, they're used to you doing everything for them. And it's not easy. Like they don't accept that well. And it's hard to change that relationship dynamic. So you might have needed a change. And now now that you're away and now that you've experienced that, you can be like, hey, maybe I can start a gym with boundaries. <laughs> you right. Know? Right. There's right. something, you know. Right. Right. And they always say like the main goal, like I like my purpose, right? Especially with everything, was always take care of my family. And that's obviously since I was young, right? It's just that's just one of those things that brought me joy. And like, I've noticed that when I I did have crank, I wasn't spending as much time with my son as I think I could have, you know, Mm -hmm. because I was running around or going to a lunch or meeting someone because they want to talk or on the phone or, you know, I'm there with him and I, you know, picked him up from school, did everything I can the times I needed to, but it wasn't really there, you know, Mm -hmm. and then quarantine did it. Like, it was like, oh, we're here doing school with him more. And And then my wife is at work, you know, so she started working at that place that took us here. And I just, you know, luckily, thank God, thank God. And I was just doing what I can from the gym with the help of my parents, you know, watching my my son and bring him to, to school. Everyone has that story too. But I just didn't feel connected to him, you know. And that was always my thing was to be a great dad. That's it. That's like, that's the only thing I ever said I wanted. And this was like 2010. Like, that's it. Like, that was my, always my goal if anyone ever asked me. And I wasn't doing that, right? So now it's crazy. I had a whole year and a half of literally being a stay-at-home dad and just doing what I can with, with social media and, you know, online stuff that the connection with my kids, like I'm I'm a, the PTA dad, like I'm a PTA dad that I don't even know where we were. So. I don't know. Any questions? You can move on to the next one. All right. Whatever you got. So what are your formal diagnoses? Formal diagnoses, my goodness. Okay, um, <clears throat> formal diagnosis, first time I got diagnosed, um, I really didn't know what it was. I really didn't care. Uh, my dad, my parents, we would fight a lot at work, and I got really physical, like um, not with them, but like with myself, really self-harming, hurting. Like when my dad saw me, like I was smashing my head into the mirror, and like I was bleeding. So he pretty much said, you need to see a psychiatrist, and I ended up seeing his. Um, he's in Nutley. Um, but when I was there, I just wasn't open to it. You know, I was just there. So yeah. they sat me down, going really through have questions. You to go on your own terms. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. They labeled me uh, bipolar. Didn't even care what that was. Didn't know. Um, all I know is that I got three medications, was Paxil, Lithium, and Viagra. And I was really excited about Viagra. So I didn't care. So I just took it, drank on it, did everything. No therapy after that. I just see him once a week, uh, once a month, just for um, pretty much to get more medicine. Right? Okay. But I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. But now when I got re-diagnosed recently, um, after uh, it's like, you know what? I need help. This is right before I attempted um, a really bad place when I was uh, during a pandemic. Um, I was like, I need to seek help. So I went to a new one. 
And then obviously they labeled me bipolar, um, uh, BPD, so uh, personality disorder, um, whatever. And I kind of studied it a little bit. I looked it up and I said, that's what this means? I had zero idea what bipolar was. I thought I just had superhuman energy and superhuman powers at time. It would explain so much about what I've been going through since I guess first diagnosis was like 26 until 40 something. So during that time, I just thought that was me, right? I thought this was who I was. This is just my energy all the time. I'm not knowing that it's mania, you know, and that's the times where I was like spending tons of money and I like, couldn't explain it or, you know, thinking developing a lot of good things came out of it, right? Like I opened the gym, I did all this stuff. But like right. not knowing those manic moments could have been a little bit more controlled and or or there. Um, they, they labeled me obviously bipolar, um, anorexic, bulimic, eating disorder. Um, what else they say? I think that was really it more recently, but not really understanding at all what it did or what it was, you know, and I think that was, like you said, I didn't care. I was just like a teenager sitting in the chair, like whatever, whatever, you know? So. Yeah. I think that's where I started out too with like, you have to go to therapy. And I was like yeah. such a teenager about it that yeah. I was like, fuck off. Like, yeah. I remember them showing me the ink block cards and I was like, clearly they're killing themselves. And then they'd show me another one. I'm like, he's jumping out a window. And they'd show me another. I'm like, he's committing suicide. And I was like, you are purposely showing me the cards about suicide. Yeah. And they were like, no, <laughs> there are ink blocks. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. You really got to come to it and want it on your own. Right. Right. Uh, luckily, we both luckily we both made it there eventually. Yeah. Right? Yes. I didn't know. So you too. So you went you went to IOP, but you were you've been in therapy for I've been in therapy forever. <laughs> I don't know. Probably willingly. I think I started when I was maybe 20. Okay. Um, so yeah. On and off, in and out of, you know, I've done all the different individual groups, support groups, right? IOP, yep, been all over the place. Everything. But okay. It's, I am a very big advocate for therapy. I have this whole theory that this is how we're going to stop school shootings. I'm like, because I think, okay, do you want to hear my theory? Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, we have, I don't know, when we were kids, we called them specials in right. school, like gym, art, whatever. Right. I'm like, therapy, not like- right. Not the guidance counselor where the whole class goes once a month or whatever it is they do. Like individual therapy, hmm. make it part of their specials from elementary school. It eliminates the stigma. It would, you know, bring yeah. up any family issues. It would make it so much more clear if there's kids who need extra help, they'd have someone to talk to. They would just go into life right? so much more, you know able to regulate their emotions and talk about their emotions and it would be such an easy way to pick up on the red flags and yeah, um, I, yeah and it know. educates them like it educates them I'm like yeah. look listen to me i was 20 something years old i didn't know what anything meant i was just like yeah. therapy brr, you know no, I, I think like how old was i the first time i was able to say the words i love you to someone <laughs> you know like but now i'm a big advocate everyone should be in therapy That's it. i like it i like it i do it's such a great um thought that like it would cover so much. <laughs> like, it would right. pay more. There's so much. There's so, so much, much it would, you know. Even if it was groups, like small groups. Yeah. That's it. Too bad. I, I know financially it's right. not the easiest, but right. I'm like, that's, how much money better? are you paying for insurance on those school shootings and right. the bullying and all yeah. that? Like right. you know. Yeah. So. Cool. Um, well, my next question was the yep. age of onset. You kind of said age of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. When did you notice like symptoms and stuff starting? I didn't notice anything until I turned the more recent one. So 40, what was that three? So pandemic is kind of that time is when I really realized that this is, this is what it was. I didn't know. I know they told me I was bipolar, but I didn't know what that meant. I did not care. I still called people. What are you bipolar? You know, I just say stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> It was like, oh, no, that's not at all what it means. And then I found out. So I was 45 now. So I'm like 42 years old. Three years ago, I actually understood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what it was. It's a big thing. Anytime I hear someone whose kids are diagnosed with like, whether it's a mental health thing or like autism or something like that. And I'm like, listen, they're the same person. You right. just have all of these resources at your fingertips now. Like right. you just have a name and <clears throat> you can look it up and 
understand it better and understand how to help them. So right. it's good to actually look up what the diagnosis is. <laughs> yeah, to actually know. And I, I yeah. like, like my mind opened up, like when just reading about it, I was like, what? Are you mm-hmm. serious? Yeah. Ugh, explain amazing. so much. Explain so much. Amazing. There's a book that I read called The Body Keeps the Score. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've ever heard of it. It's no. more about trauma. It's like a trauma book and it explains how your brain stores trauma and like parts of your brain turn off during trauma to protect yes. you. So the way you mem- you remember it isn't in chronological order. You kind of just have snippets based on what brain was activated because you go into fight or flight mode right. and it's literally just survival. And I'm like, so much of what I read, I was like, oh, I'm not just crazy. <laughs> like it <laughs> makes so much sense. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel that your diagnoses are correct. Did you have any like misdiagnoses? Um, I want to say, no, I think they're correct. Yeah. I think they were right. You know, I, I think I misdiagnosed myself, not by not being like willing to learn more about what it is they just told me. You know, mm-hmm. when I got, when they diagnosed me, I was like, no way. What's that mean? Like, it's whatever. I just means that that just means I have this, but I still didn't look into it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, let me think. I mean, maybe like personality disorder, I guess, but I don't really understand it too much. You know what I mean? For me to do so, but they'll just label you as like uh, bipolar, you know, in your your file, you know, based off the questions that I answered. Um, right. That's what they say. But it's a, so I believe that one is pretty broad, but that's for me. Um, but bipolar really just dials into everything that I've done. I'm not saying there's not any... Um, um, there's some not, uh, where it's not quality. It's the, my, the qualities of my personality disorder. Um, like some of them are true. Some of them are like, oh, maybe not really. So I ch- I kind of question those things where it's like, mm, it could just be also just part of the other one, you know, maybe too much. I feel like anxiety and depression comes in the wave. So it's hard to, to really to know, you know. So I just want to clarify something. I heard you say BPD before. Was that yeah. bipolar or is that border? Border both. So that's oh, what they okay. had. Yeah, that was. I just remember the acronyms that were next to my name. So <laughs> it's just well. I'm like, it doesn't help that they're the same letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bipolar okay. and and uh, yes, that one Got borderline it. personality. So that's the one. I was like, ah, I don't I feel like it's yeah. part of it. You know, I feel like it's just. I know that one's a little. It's a buffet. It's included. It is, and I have so much. Like sometimes my therapist is like. I think you're on the autism spectrum. She's like the most, <laughs> I love her to death, but she's so blunt. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, can we do something about it? And she's like, nah, it's just mm. who you are. And I'm yeah. like, but then I look into it and I'm like, okay, like ADHD, PTSD, autism, like all of the symptoms are so similar that I'm like, right. eh. <laughs> it's what? just too much. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Just maybe we just don't fit into boxes and you can just figure out what works. Good for you. one. That's a good one. You that's know? such a good, such a good line. It's good line. Yeah. That's that's what I use about my sexuality too. People are always like, what, what is your sexuality? I'm like, not good at check boxes. That's, right. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> I all had right. an endoscopy a few weeks ago on my um, thing. Mm-hmm. Like, it, they asked you all the questions. I wonder oh. was like, your method of contraception. And I was like, there's all these options. And I just, like, wrote my own little line. <laughs> and yeah. I just wrote, being gay. Yeah. <laughs> like, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. Yeah, it's my little tangent. <laughs> I like, it. I like um, it. What have been the greatest obstacles you've faced? Oh, the what have been the greatest obstacles I faced? Oh, or, an, or any uh, yeah. obstacles? Oh, I like I like the greatest because it's <laughs> like it's such a such a good way to say like it's such a good way to it's such a good question, right? Because most of the time, like you can say what obstacles have you faced, and I could go down dirt road, right? Uh, this was where I did. No, it's like the greatest obstacle I faced was making it through that time where I want to kill myself. Like mm-hmm. that is literally the the biggest time to where I did not notice or see anything that was happening to me. Life was just moving really fast because I was just trying to, like I said, please and figure out other people and what can I do for them? What can I do for them? What can I do for them? I got to get them to work out. I got to make sure this gym opens up. We just opened this gym like a year, you know? And so it's like just trying to make all this, how to make money back. How am I going to make money back? I'll make Zooms. I'll do Zooms. I'll do five Zooms a day. Mm -hmm. I'll do three park workouts. I'll kill myself. And it got to the point where it's like, I can just kill myself and this will be all over. 
like all of this will be over, you know, and like that, that obstacle of like overcoming that part and just not just going to the hospital instead of doing that was the best thing I've ever done, you know, because yeah. there's something about that day that didn't let me do it. Like I just, I just didn't do it. It wasn't family. It wasn't thinking of, you know, it just, I just didn't do it. Right. Yes. And I went and I That's called. All that matters. That's it. That's it. I uh, I shot an email at like 5.30 in the morning to my therapist. And I was like, hey, I think I'm going to kill myself. What do I do? They called me immediately. <laughs> like I'm they, sure they loved they that. They called me immediately. And I, I just didn't think of like what else. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want to call 911. I didn't want to wake up my wife. I didn't want to do anything. So I was like, maybe I'll shoot them an email. Maybe they'll contact me today and I can have an appointment at nine. You know? Mm -hmm. They called in like a minute. I don't know how they figured that one out. And they're like, no, you have to go to the hospital. I was like, I'm not going to the hospital. No. And then they're like, no, no, no. Either you're going to go to the hospital or the police are going to come to your house and pick you up. You already told us that you're going to kill yourself. We now have to bring you to the hospital. So yeah. I drove myself to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are the things that like I'll shoot my therapist a text and she'll call and yell at me and be like, that is not something you put in a text. <laughs> She's like, you call me or you call 911. I'm like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just, that's how I felt. I couldn't, it was yes. overwhelming. I'm crying right now, please. Yeah, yeah I get out. it. That was the that was definitely the biggest obstacle, you know, and I could say the second greatest obstacle was learning to learning to not really like, like you said, what was the word boundaries? Like really developing my boundaries with my friends, my friends that are there. Like I don't have many friends here. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I have any friends. Right? I have people that I talk to once in a while, uh, but like even my friends, because it's the same. They, they, you know, they'll talk the same and they'll speak the same. And it kind of just doesn't feel. It just doesn't feel right right now. You know, like talking to my friends, they just don't. It just doesn't feel good. So for me, to just be like, listen, I'm I'm not going to talk to you guys for a little bit because I just need my space you know now, i don't hate you i love you 100 percent. something happens to you i'm coming but like right now just leave me the fuck alone you know and it's, yeah the people you surround yourself with it really affects your psyche and everything so yeah yeah you yeah, know so so would you say that was your rock bottom or is there another point oh i don't know has there I, been a rock bottom i think every like rock bottom was me getting diagnosed <laughs> so it's like but so the one <laughs> rock bottom was when my my father um, told me to go to the therapist to go see a psychiatrist when I was literally like punching. I was punching myself. I was cutting myself. I was smashing myself, you know, my face. I was doing many, a lot of self harm. And that whole thing was happening again. You know, so it was those two moments where I was doing a lot of cutting, slicing, and burning. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, getting out of that, learning how to cope with those things is the, the win. You know, that's the yeah. win. We're coming down to 10 minutes here. It's fast. Ready? Yeah. Okay. What have been the greatest supports for you, both clinically and personally? Like, what when, has helped you? The uh, the group, the not the hospital itself, um, but after the uh, the rehab group or IOP, IOP, IOP. Yeah. yeah. It's just intensive outpatient. Yes. Yes. I met just people that through Zoom. Right. Thank God I didn't have to. I wasn't showing up nowhere. Thank God <laughs> it was. Thank God it was COVID because I wouldn't have gone. I was like, nope, my, my family needs me type thing. But yeah. um, just meeting and talking to these people where I still have relationship with some of them, you know, some of them I'm still friends me with. Too. Yeah, it's really, really cool. One of them I actually knew surprisingly i was so like in the Zoom I. Meeting. yeah it was so weird he was i on logged on and i immediately turned off my camera and <laughs> yes. messaged, i was like i know that person yeah. and they're like oh well what do you want to do i was like i don't know i don't know what am i supposed to do but it, it ended up working out and yeah. we still talk all the time so yeah yeah it's uh it's cool so that was uh that was it yeah do you have any advice for people who are struggling with their mental illness or people who are trying to support someone in their life who is struggling with mental illness? I think listening to what you're about to do is the most important thing someone can do. Because I could sit here and tell you to go to therapy. I could sit here and tell you to do all these things, but you're not going to do it, right? Until it resonates with you in a story, just like you're doing with this book or um, project that you have, like that's the best thing you can do. Of course, you want to find people that um, have been through it and can and can lead you in that direction, but you still have to do it. Like you still have, like I was, by, I was diagnosed bipolar. I didn't care. 
And mm. for 20 years, I just didn't, it was very ignorant towards the fact that like I had this thing and then I didn't care anymore. Like, I actually forgot about it, you know? And a lot of times we think that we're going through something and then once we get over it, that it's over, but it's not because it's going to come back, you yeah. know? So I think the faster that you really, you nail that down is is where it's, where a lot of the progress does start is just understanding and understanding more about what it is you might be going through. I think there's a lot about connection too with those like support groups and people who just have been there and understand, but- I recently, somebody in my support group came in and he was, he said something that really stuck with me. He was kind of shocked. And he said, all of the people I've met who have been through this have been not bad people, but like harmful people to be around. And, you know, we said hurt people, hurt people, but hurt people (laughs) who put in the effort to heal can help people. Yeah. You know? So you got to surround yourself with those people who are actively working to, you know, make progress in their yeah. whatever it is, be it trauma, mental illness, anything like, because some people just get stuck in that cycle of hurt people, hurt people. And we got right. to be the people who heal ourselves and help people to break that cycle. Right. It's a good one. I like that one. And is there anything you want people to know about your mental illness or just mental illness in general? Uh, hmm. So. That's a good question. What was it what was I gonna say before? It was really to I guess what you talked about before is to is the goal, right? It's stopping the stigma. But not only that, but also the overdiagnosis of it. Like you say you are these things, mm-hmm. but you really have sometimes have no idea like what you're saying, you know. Right. So like I said before, is just educate yourself a little bit. And don't be as ignorant as I was in the point where I was using these terms so easily or so fluidly. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. Like until someone points it out to you, you don't even notice you're doing it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like I'm like, oh, don't do it because of this. No, I'm just saying like, learn something about it. If you know someone has anxiety, why don't you learn a little bit more about it to see if you can help them in some way or how can you talk to them differently? If you know someone has OCD, then or does he really have OCD? Do you really have OCD? Or are you just saying it like learn before you use the words? Mm-hmm. Like for me, i never said I was bipolar until I actually understood what it was. Now I can even still today, I'm like, yeah, I'm bipolar, but I don't want to say it, but it's like, it's who I am. Like it's, it's right. like, it's something that I have and I'm just working through it. I think the best thing that everyone can do is go to therapy whether or whether or not you are you have or do not have something just the ability to talk to someone and be able to share and to be able to get whatever it is inside your head inside your chest mm-hmm. like out like this world would definitely like you said not be everyone. as angry everyone everyone, can everyone. from therapy everyone fucking talk to and somebody i'm just going to add on to that if you get a bad therapist try again Yes. Yes. Like if a good therapist, when you go in, will say that you are interviewing them. And if it's not a good fit, that's okay. And they will be okay with that and find someone who is a good fit. Just like, it's, you know, you're not going to click with everyone. So just don't give up after the first shot because it can be life changing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we getting kicked off the time? We're going to get kicked off. But yeah, what else? You got something? I don't know. You can, you can kick me off if you want. <laughs> I'm not kicking you off. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to share before we get kicked off? If you have any questions for me, you can. But no, I'm just glad you had me here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm glad you came out. I'm glad you reached out. You know, a lot of people don't do that. Um, but I'm glad you actually did it. You know, a lot of people reach out yeah. and then they they shy away. They never That's they never big. want to do this. So I have uh, so many contracts right now with people who are like, <laughs> Yeah, I'll be in your book, and then no, the, they're yeah. just gone. <laughs> yep, like, yep, it's work, you know, it, it, it's 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 tough. It's not easy stuff to talk about. But. No, but I, I do appreciate you doing this with me. And can we do a part two? Sure. I'm gonna ask you now. Yes. All right, because we want to know a little bit more. Maybe there's some stories that you want to share on your side now. Yeah, um, you can ask me questions. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'll have a book update or something. <laughs> part two for sure. I always love part two. All right. All so right. let's close out. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, let's give a round of applause for Laura. It's our first time on a Zoom and or not on Zoom, but and on or a, a podcast. Podcast. Yes. Yeah. I was and being nervous, a host. But... I'm glad. 
I'm Thank glad you for here. having me. It of was course. fun. Of course. And if you guys are there, uh, we'll keep you updated with the book. She'll be back for part two. We're coming out to episode number show, I show, I show with Laura Quirk. <laughs> it was such a great time uh, having you here on the podcast. And I do appreciate you taking the time to ask me questions today. Um, Absolutely. We it's definitely can do it again. So say goodbye to everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Hope you enjoyed. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out old school vlog way. See you guys next week. Subscribe, like, comment, and make sure you guys subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Next episode or next episode? Next episode. Not next episode. Next episode.